Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I am here today at the Rock Island Auction House checking out some of the guns that are going to be in their upcoming February of 2016 regional auction. And an example, they have here an example of a type of gun that definitely deserves a video on this channel, and that is a turret revolver. Now traditionally today we think of revolvers as having a whole series of cylinders that are all uh, parallel with each other. Well, that's the common thing today, but early on, why not have them arranged like the spokes in a wheel, radiating out from a center point? That's a version, that's a, a method that was used on a number of early revolving rifles and pistols, and here we have an example of a vertical turret rifle. Now this particular one is actually one of the more popular and more successful types of rifles like this. This is a first variant of the, the turret rifle made by a man named Perry W. Porter. He patented this design in 1851, so this is just slightly ahead of the, the real popularity of repeating lever action rifles. Um, this came right at the very end of the, the cap and ball era in firearms, and would become very obviously outdated as soon as metallic cartridges were easily usable, easily accessible. So what's really cool about this thing is the whole side plate of the rifle opens up and we can get this great view of exactly what's going on and all sorts of mechanical weirdness inside. So I'm going to go straight to that. Let me bring the camera back here and show you. So Porter made several versions of this gun, and this is actually a first variation. And what's interesting to note here is that we do not have any nipples for traditional percussion caps. Like I said, this was an 1851 patent, so this is using, think of this as using the same technology as like an 1851 Navy Colt revolver. Now, what Porter did differently was he had a magazine of caps located here that would get hit by this hammer right here, and the resulting spark would go through a hole in this cover plate and into a little hole just like that right there. That would detonate the charge or ignite the charge. Um, now he did have a later version. The third model of this gun was simplified and used just a, a standard percussion cap, pre-capped cylinder sort of system instead of the extra complexity in this early one. All right, before I open this up, let's take a quick look at how it functions. We have a lever here, very much like a standard lever action rifle lever. It does have a manual safety on it back here. You can lock the lever, but we'll pull that back. When I pull the lever down, it is going to lift the hammer and then rotate the cylinder. We're now ready to fire. I can run the lever again to index the cylinder another location, and when I pull the trigger, the hammer drops sideways. Pull that hammer drops down there. Now we have a big hinge pin right here. Um, this screw would have originally held in place a kind of serpentine looking loading lever that you would use to ram powder and ball into the cylinder while it's mounted to the rifle. That is missing on this example, unfortunately. But uh, to open this up, we're going to take this lever here, lift it up. That unlocks the side plate of the action. And then I can lift this all open like that. And we'll take a closer look over here in a moment. But first, our actual cylinder goes right there. We have two little pieces of spring sheet steel right here that tension this cylinder to keep it nice and tight. Now this is a nine shot revolving cylinder. You can actually count the fire holes here. There's nine of them. And then the long drag looking marks and the single holes are there for uh, camming, for rotating the cylinder, and for locking it in place. On the back you just have one big peg that uh, fits into the action of the gun. It's approximately a 40 caliber piece. They were made in a couple of different calibers. Um, if we look at this, you can, you can see by the rough finish here that, that the frames of these guns were actually cast, which is a clever way to do it. It allows you to get a complex shape without a whole lot of uh, machining effort. So they'd have cast this and then finished, for example, this uh, bearing surface where the, the cylinder rotates. All right, now looking at the other side of our main 
action side plate here. You can see we have a piece of sheet steel here with a peg on it. This is what locks the cylinder in place. We have another peg right here on the lever. That is what is used to index the cylinder. So this peg right here locks into these outer holes and this peg pushes against these. Now you All right, when I go to run the lever, this would normally be held up slightly by the cylinder, this piece of sheet metal goes into this slot in the lever and it lifts it up slightly, which releases and unlocks the cylinder so that this button can then index the cylinder and rotate it by one position. Now to cock the hammer, this piece of steel right here is actually a flat metal spring um, that the hammer is, is resisting, pushing against. When we pull the lever here, I am lifting the hammer up against tension on this spring and I am also pulling this block forward. When it goes far enough, this sear locks in there, right there, and now pressure on the lever is released. The hammer is being held up against this spring. So there you can see the hammer is lifted up, ready to fire. When we lift, if you push this peg up, this end comes down, which releases the sear and allows the hammer to drop. That is done, get back in here, by the trigger. So this trigger simply pushes up on this lever. Pretty simple system. Oh, and this right here is the uh, business end of the fire hole through which uh, primer spark comes. We have these three holes here and a matching three holes right in here. And those are basically just gas relief holes. So you know you're going to lose some, some gas at the intersection of the cylinder and the barrel right here. And those holes allow it to vent in a, a safe and easy direction. Don't want to put your hand over those when you fire. All right, now here's where things get a little bit more complicated and where I'm not entirely sure of how this element functioned. So we have the hammer cocked, we have this fire hole beneath it, and then we also have a magazine of percussion caps on top, well, on the side of the gun. It's a little difficult to open, there we go. So this plate opens up and reveals a magazine underneath. We have so this center spring-loaded wheel rotates like this. It's got a little wound up coil spring underneath. And what you would do, as far as I understand, is you would actually line up a bunch of caps in here. What I'm not sure of is what prevents them all from just falling out. Um, because when the rifle is cocked, like this, a cap is ready. And in theory, the way it works is when you pull the trigger, the hammer smacks into a cap and propels some spark down through that hole, like so. Uh, once the hammer is down, it prevents more caps from coming out. But as soon as you operate the lever, the hammer recocks. And now, I don't, what I don't know is if this example is missing some small piece, or if there's just something to this design that I'm not quite understanding correctly. But something prevents the caps from all just falling out here and, and falling down along the side of the action. Of course, it's important to note that the center line of this rifle has this big nine chambered vertical turret sticking out of it, so you can't have the sights right in the middle of the action, or of the, the barrel, so the sights are offset to the left, so an offset rear sight, and then all the way up here, our offset front sight. So that's why those are, are done that way. There is no front handguard on this rifle, you just kind of Stick your hand out there and hold on wherever you feel like. Now, the reason that these never became popular is probably self-evident to some people already, but consider that uh, cap and ball revolvers occasionally chain fire, where the spark jumps from one fire hole to the next and more than one cylinder fires simultaneously. In a traditional revolver, that's not that big of a problem. I mean, obviously a problem, but assuming you're pointing the gun in the safe direction, you might damage part of the revolver, 
but you're not going to like shoot anybody unintentionally. With a turret revolver like this, these things are pointing in all sorts of different directions simultaneously, and one of them is always pointing directly back at you, the shooter. In fact, several of them are. This one's gonna, you know, if, if I'm sitting down firing this thing, this is gonna hit me, this one's gonna hit me, that one's gonna hit me, should it decide to chain fire. Uh, this was a daunting proposition. Um, regardless of how common it was actually being, how, how often these things actually chain fired, it was a possibility that people didn't like, and it certainly hurt the commercial feasibility of these guns. Um, in fact, this, this was in some ways a competitor to Colt's 1855 revolving rifle, and uh, Colt himself and his marketing kind of skewed facts a bit and claimed that Porter, the developer of this gun, actually shot himself and killed himself with one of his own guns, which is not true. Um, in fact, Porter lived just fine. Uh, after the basically commercial failure of these guns, he went back to making more traditional guns and, and had a reasonably successful career. Uh, in total, about 1,200 of these Porter turret rifles were made. I mentioned this is the first pattern. You can tell that because it's got this squared off um, cap magazine on top. You will also find them with a circular magazine up here. That would be the second version. And then if you find one that has a, a, a cylinder that has actual nipples for regular percussion caps, that's the third pattern. And that was a simplified gun. Some people were willing to buy these. Um, they were a bit complex, uh, but they did offer nine shots of repeating firepower in a rifle, which is not something you could get all that easily any other way in 1851. So some people were willing to buy them. A lot of people decided that it wasn't worth the risk, regardless of how real that risk was versus just uh, imaginary. And uh, that led to turret rifles of all sorts generally being commercial failures. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, this rifle, of course, is coming up for sale here, like everything at the auction. So if you are interested in it, uh, probably more for cool factor and hang on the wall rather than to actually shoot and potentially shoot yourself with, uh, go ahead and take a look in the description text below. You'll find a link to Rock Island's catalog page on this. It is actually the number two lot in this upcoming auction, so just about the, the first thing in the morning that they're going to auction off. So if you want it, you could either come here in person to uh, participate in the auction early in the morning or place a sealed or telephone bid. Uh, easy setup through their catalog. Thanks for watching.